Good morning and afternoon to everyone joining us for today's webinar on why Zero Trust Networks Matter. With me today from Pharos, I have Sriram Achatuni, the Senior Vice President of Global Marketing and Sales, as well as John Janikowski, a Senior Solutions Architect. They will be sharing trends we're seeing in this space, explaining what Zero Trust is, the benefits of a Zero Trust network, how it protects your data and helps defend against modern cyber threats, as well as our vision for a safe and convenient print experience. Before Sriram and John take it away, I wanted to call your attention to the questions area within your GoToWebinar panel on your screen. If any questions come to mind during today's event, please type them into the questions area. Today's webinar is only 45 minutes, so if we don't have time to answer questions live, we will respond to them when we follow up via email with a link to the recording of today's event. So with that, I'm going to turn my webcam off and I'll hand it over to Sriram. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Um, thank you, everybody who's joining us today. And apologies uh, for a few minutes delay in the start here. Um, so hopefully you're all settling in and are able to see the screen. So yeah, I'm very excited about this uh, topic today. It's to why zero trust been uh, something we've been talking quite a bit internally and also externally to the customers and partners alike. So uh, before we jump into that, I just want to take a quick moment and uh, share with you who's Pharos. Uh, a lot of you guys the, uh, on the call here may already know us, but for some who don't, uh, just a brief overview. Um, John, if you can, uh, if you don't mind me through uh, the slide. Thank you, John. Um, so Pharos, we are, as most of you guys know, we've uh, been in the industry. Um, uh, we, we are a leader in the print space, uh, print management software specifically. We were founded in uh, 1992 in Auckland and uh, we're headquartered in Rochester, New York. Uh, that's where I am actually not physically sitting anymore, uh, but in my home office for now. But uh, uh, when things uh, are back to normal, I guess uh, we're all going to be in the uh, office. Uh, so, anyway, our headquarters is in Rochester, New York, and, uh, and we have several offices across the nation uh, and also worldwide. Um, John, uh, please continue to uh, click through. So the pr fundamental premises of why we exist and what our core uh, philosophy is, is that we want the print the way it should be. It all started with uh, us really um, trying to understand the print as a problem many years back. It moved along, uh, the, as we uh, went along the way, we realized it's actually not the print as a problem, it's how we go about it and the process and the people behind it and how we can make it a, a easier path. So we believe the print the way it should be is it should be simple, it should be secure, which I think we'll be talking a lot about in particular today, and also scalable, which means whether you're at home, whether you're office, however you you're, uh, you expand your business, um, we should we wanna be out uh, there. And I, one other comment about the core culture of our, ourselves, we, we are a B certified corporation for our certified B corporation for people who know, what that means, um, we are very particular in how we conduct our business, and we like to um, uh, hold ourselves to a certain level of car carbon neutral footprint and things we do in our company. So this is very particular to us. And also the way we conduct business with print in particular, reducing the carbon footprint across the board. So uh, anyway, that's just a quick overview of who we are. Um, and then I wanna just dive, dive into real quick as to what products we have. Uh, many of you probably know, um, we started in the industry many years back uh, serving the Uniprint, so starting with Uniprint, serving the higher education market. Um, and over time, we've gone into the enterprise business as well with our Blueprint software. And, the, and these are both um, on-premise products or you know, some people call it a hybrid where you can host it privately in a, net, in a hosted uh, cloud. But uh, many years back, about seven or eight years back, we invested heavily in a truly cloud-native, um, public cloud, public cloud-based cloud product called Beacon. And that's uh, one of our uh, flagship products today as well for, uh, to serve in the cloud market. We've been doing this for a while, it's, uh, since 2014, and it's uh, evolving every day. Um, so the core, um, John, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, so we, we see a fundamental shift in the market from the print infrastructure perspective to be from on-premise to the cloud. 
So this uh, particular slide, you know, my goal is to show you what we envision and how we have been seeing our customers also evolve. Our goal is to reduce the print infrastructure. Our goal is to make print as a service and really work with you to see whether if you're on-premise today or if you're com coming up with a hybrid solutions of creating them, you know, some maybe within the firewall, some maybe not within the firewall. Um, and John, if you can progress the slide, please. Um, and then our, our goal is to be, give you a seamless path wherever you are in that transition process of being on-premise or, on uh, or hosted in the cloud or if you're fully uh, you know, ready to adapt to native cloud solutions. Even if it's parts and bits and pieces in some offices it is on-premise, some offices it is full cloud. But that's the evolution that we have seen and that's the trend that we have seen in, in, in the industry and that's what we have evolved ourselves as with all the products that we have. And that's a trend we continue to see fairly aggressive. Um, so, um, so today we'll talk a little bit about the market direction um, and what are the trends that we see specific to um, the IT world and uh, also the print path itself. So the two common trends we see um, really that we have uh, embraced um, they're fundamental to our product line is the zero trust. And then we're gonna talk a lot about that today. John will go through that. But you can see some of the trends here, like almost 80% of the IT uh, security teams are looking to embrace zero trust. And uh, the other significant aspect of this is to reduce infrastructure itself behind the print. And that's where we also believe that this has to be a zero infrastructure kind of a journey. So these, both these markets are not only are growing, which is an indication of what people want, this is also what we have taken as a direction to the market. So these are going to be very fundamental to what we do and how we do our business for um, hopefully many years to come. So just uh, wanted to start with that before we jump in. And the specific impacts of COVID. Um, we're all in, this, uh, in some sort of a new world, um, new norms, new world, whatever we call it. Uh, so we've been trying to follow the trends quite closely here. Again, trends are being established as we speak, so I don't know if all of us have the answers to this yet. But uh, a significant part of this already from what we've seen from the industry analysts and from our own customers, such as a large bank, they're expecting about 30% of the workforce not to maybe come back to office, um, or um, also how the IT is really seeing uh, from a security standpoint. Um, most of the cyber threats uh, right now, I think there's a study that says that they have increased by 600%. So again, uh, what we have seen is, especially in the last three months, our conversations with our customers and partners and prospects and uh, people out there, it's been a significant uh, focus on infrastructure as a service and especially the zero trust. So um, that, that's really what leads to this particular uh, event today. And to add to that, uh, again, one of the um, industry analysts points to this specifically in an article, um, glad to be mentioned there along uh, with other industry leaders in the space, um, is specifically that this pandemic itself is actually pushing us forward significantly in the adaption of zero infrastructure and zero trust. And I'd love to hear from you in the audience today. If you have a chance, ask us questions, let us know if you see the same. So with that said, John, I think the fundamental question we all have is what is zero trust and how does it really apply and how, why does it matter? Yep, well, I'm glad you asked, Sriram, thank you. Um, so zero trust, um, it, it's uh, a topic or a concept. It, it has many definitions. Um, each kind of take their own interpretation. Uh, I, I think for our conversation here, I think we just need to necessarily define the concept so we can kind of set ground rules for, for the conversation. You, when you look up zero trust, you might find various different resources around it. Um, the general concept is that zero trust is a security paradigm or it's a, it's a model, a set of principles that um, uh, an organization can adopt or take to, to essentially change how they're approaching cybersecurity. Um, the traditional approach of establishing a robust perimeter and, and really defining a, a, a barrier or a wall for your network um, is uh, kind of falling short in light of some of the new ways that uh, technology is expanding. Um, the, the area of the corporate network is growing as we see moves into the cloud and, and things along those lines. 
um, there's also new threats that are arising um, from the uh, from how attackers are essentially overcoming existing defenses. So zero trust isn't a technology. It's not a, a product that you can procure or anything. It's not not even necessarily a standard that you would abide by. Um, it is uh, really just, it's about changing your mindset and how you think about cybersecurity. So it requires us to forego some of our assumptions, uh, things that we've relied on in the past. Um, and uh, when I mentioned that it has varying definitions, so zero trust, that term started uh, a gentleman named John Kinderbag with Forrester Research kind of coined that term to define zero trust as, as this concept. Um, but other organizations have, have taken it and internalized it themselves and kind of made variations of it as well. So uh, Google has implemented this approach within their organization. Um, they, they labeled their personal model as beyond corp. Uh, but Microsoft, Cisco, some of the other uh, big names in the in the market have also kind of published their own strategies as well around this. Um, so for our conversation today, we're going to focus on uh, or rely on um, uh, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology. Um, they released a, a special publication number uh, 800-207 that def uh, essentially defines uh, zero trust. Um, they surmise zero trust to essentially consist of, of seven tenets or, or principles. Um, so uh, the seven tenets are gonna consist of all communication is secured regardless of net, network location. So in many organizations, the focus has been on traffic that's leaving the organization um, and, and needing to pay attention to that or protect that. Um, this is a key driver for VPNs and, and HTTPS for, for web connectivity. Um, but, but traffic inside the network wasn't necessarily treated the same. Um, there was a, maybe an implied trust of the users on the network. And so uh, we didn't have to protect every conversation. Uh, we could just assume that, that people wouldn't be looking in that sense. Um, with zero trust though, all communication needs to be secured. Um, it's in, that, in secure, we mean encrypted. Um, so there no no plain text communication between components. Um, even a mundane communication can have value to an attacker if it helps them to define uh, what the network looks like or, or how uh, workflows are, are being conducted. So we want to make sure that that's protected. Um, in addition, all data sources and computing services have to be considered resources. So um, obviously the 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 go-tos that you would think of in the sense of databases or servers, things along those lines are resources, but we also have to consider um, maybe data agents that are feeding a SaaS application or uh, an IoT system that's interacting with an actuator um, or even a, a user's personal device if it's gonna be accessing enterprise resources. Um, Access to individual enterprise resources is granted on a per session basis. So this means the verification uh, is conducted to authenticate and authorize uh, one resource isn't necessarily going to apply to another resource. Um, not necessarily saying that uh, um, this has to occur right before the connection is established or, or something along those lines, but just that um, when you need to access a resource um, that that access that you're granted applies specifically to that resource and not to a set or a group of resources um, or relying on that connection, I guess, to, to access other resources aside from that. Um, now, access to resources is determined by dynamic policy and may include other behavioral attributes. Um, essentially, to achieve this, the organization has to know what resources it has in its environment who the users are in the environment that are that's going to be dealing with, and which resources each user or member should have access to. Um, it may also take into account other factors um, like the device state, uh, what what uh, software version is the the device running on, uh, or maybe behavioral attributes such as uh, other resources that that device has has accessed or or um, things that, that that resource has been doing previously, um, basing the, that information on, on usage analytics, essentially. Um, the policy is gonna define which members need access to which resources, um, and it's gonna 
um, be based on the, the business process, the acceptable level of risk that, that we can have. Um, and the permissions are set to lease privilege. Um, that's a, a, a historic principle that's out there, a principle of lease privilege. Um, that is one of the, the core facets of, of a zero trust environment as well. Um, another tenant that the enterprise assures that all owned devices and associated devices are the most secure state possible and monitors the assets to ensure that they remain in the most secure state possible. So um, uh, to achieve something like this, uh, implementing a CDM to be able to, to monitor the devices that are out there in the environment and apply patching as necessary to make sure that they stay um, up to the, the latest and greatest that they should be at. Um, but it also means that um, we may respond differently depending on if a device meets uh, the, the defined criteria that it should have. So if a device isn't patched to the appropriate level, uh, maybe that impacts the resources that it can have access to um, as, as defined within the policy. Um, all resources and um, it need to authenticate and be authorized. Um, and it is uh, dynamic and strictly enforced before access is allowed. So uh, it's a continuous cycle. We're, we're gaining access, we're assessing threats, we're reevaluating the trust in communications as we've defined within our policy. Um, it's gonna include facets like identity access management and multi-factor authentication. Um, uh, and we may enforce re-authentication based on different criteria. So maybe it's a uh, time-based where uh, a connection expires after a certain period of time. Um, but it may also be based on uh, whether or not that, that resource was modified or uh, if we detected anomalous behaviors, depending on uh, what level of information we, we captured. Um, and that, that leads to the last tenant, which is essentially collecting as much information as possible about the current state of the network infrastructure and the communications uh, to be able to improve the security posture. So um, collection, analysis, and reflection on the data that's captured, how the network's being accessed, uh, outside information, such as um, like various threat vectors that are determined, um, all need to be taken into account so that the policy can continuously be evaluated and, and improved upon um, in order to make sure that the, 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 the tenants of zero trust or that the concept of zero trust uh, remains relevant and, and the most accurate that it can be. Um, when we look at zero trust architectures, there's um, uh, some various components and some, some new topics that are introduced in the sense of like, uh, a policy engine, a policy administrator, or even a, a policy enforcement point. Um, so the, you'll see in the top of this control plane here, uh, we have a policy engine and policy administrator defined. This is essentially uh, where the policy is being evaluated when a connection is being uh, requested. The policy en enforcement point is actually what's gonna be enabling or terminating that connection based on the feedback that it receives um, from, from the policy decision point. So these two components, um, they're separated in different planes in the sense of a control plane versus a data plane so that um, we can administrate or, or conduct the system aside from where the connections are actually being established, uh, keeping those, those um, functions isolated. Uh, but we may see policy, to, um, policy engines and administrators maybe being part of the same component. Um, maybe all three of these are, are serviced by uh, a cloud um, uh, a cloud resource of sorts, um, where when a system's looking to connect to an enterprise resource, that that connection is first being evaluated and um, and enabled by some outside uh, component of the between the um, the system itself and the enterprise resource. And then there's other various pieces that feed into this. Um, so whether you have a CDM system that's monitoring your equipment, uh, whether there's different threat intelligence that's out there in the environment as far as um, new, new uh, uh, vulnerabilities or, or threat vectors that are discovered, um, the logs that are captured from the system and evaluated, um, identity management systems, uh, uh, PKI and, and uh, the, the infrastructure that's associated with uh, managing the security and the, the encryption in the environment. Um, all of those kind of come into play 
and contribute to uh, the overall concept of zero trust. Um, so they're essentially all feeding into defining what the policy is or, or how the policy should be applied. Um, and then the, the real crux of the system is that policy and decision point and enforcement point to be able to evaluate the policy and ensure whether or not a connection should be trusted or, or not trusted. Um, this is just another example of, of how that, um, uh, that system can be applied depending on whether we're uh, running connections through maybe a gateway or something along those lines to, to be able to uh, facilitate that the policy engine being able to, to make those decisions. Hey, John, um, yeah. if you don't mind maybe jumping in asking questions on the, on the slide while they're coming That's in. That's great. Yeah, I felt appreciate Some are relevant uh, right there. So um, uh, one of the questions, what exactly is a control plane? Um, so control plane and a data plane, they're, they're logical concepts on um, uh, separating um, the, the construct of, of how these, um, these are implemented. So uh, a control plane would be uh, uh, an administrator uh, view or, or um, application that you would have to, to facilitate and um, define what the system is going to be versus the data plane itself would be the actual systems and the connections that are being made. Uh, maybe this is a, a, a next level, uh, next generation firewall or something along those lines that's actually implementing this. Um, this may be uh, a uh, like a web interface that you, that you would uh, configure the system from, if if that helps to to elaborate on that. It's probably not technical. Yeah, so the, additional, yeah, the additional question following on the same is: is it a logical or a physical separation, or is it both? Um, so. It is a logical separation in the, the concept of it. Um, they may also be physically separated as well, too, though. Okay. And one last on that. What's PDP? Action. Policy decision point. Um, so essentially, you have a system that wants to connect to a resource. So uh, that system needs to be authenticated and authorized before it's going to be granted the access to the resource. So that request is going to be captured by the enforcement point, uh, wh whatever that technology may be that's, that's going to enforce the, the connection or allow the connection to proceed. It's going to relay that, relay that information to the policy decision point, which is that, uh, that brain of the system essentially to determine, yes, this should be uh, allowed or no, this shouldn't be allowed. Uh, and maybe that's based on who the user is or which device they're they're using, um, whatever the, the policy is defined as, uh, it then sends its answer back to the policy enforcement point and the policy enforcement point actually conducts the, the transaction, whether or not it, it terminates the, the connection or allows the connection to go through. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, so uh, why, why go into zero trust? Uh, why, why do we, uh, what are the benefits that we get from a zero trust network? Um, I think first we need to take a look at the, some of the risks that are out there in the environment and, and we can respond to them based off of that. Um, so perimeter breaches are, are a, a big aspect of this. Um, it, historically, uh, environments have had that strong perimeter where we care about what's outside the network. Once you're in the network, you're essentially uh, uh, have free reign of the system or maybe maybe with certain levels of controls. Um, but credentials are often compromised um, and they've been shown to be highly successful at um, uh, getting past uh, perimeter security. Um, there was a data breach investigation report by Verizon published um, one third of breaches of the, of the perimeter security involved compromised credentials. So. It's it's a significant um, significant enough piece that the credentials usually are not going to be enough to to protect your environment in that sense. Um, once you're through the perimeter, now we have lateral movement that we can do. Lateral movement means um, an east-west communication. You may have heard it referred to as, um, but it's essentially um, I, I've moved past the perimeter. I've gotten from outside the network to inside the network. 
um, and now I can access any other resource that's inside that network, uh, or maybe rely on that that authorization from the network or from getting access to the network to be able to access further things. Um, you'll see that with uh, users being able to access file shares and things along those lines across systems, but um, there's there's quite a lot that goes into um, uh, which resources are able to communicate with other resources when you're using a, a traditional uh, security model and, and just relying on the perimeter, essentially. Um, the other aspect of this is that a flaw or a vulnerability in your perimeter uh, can have impacts to, to large sections of the network. Uh, so you may have very robust uh, uh, perimeter security, uh, but it's a kind of a weakest link in the chain concept where um, if if there's a flaw that's uh, out there in, in one of your endpoints, maybe a, a router isn't patched appropriately to where it should be, or or maybe you have a user bring a, a device in that, that allows a uh, allows kind of bypassing of the perimeter security. Um, now the user's inside the network, and essentially once you're once you're on the inside, uh, it's very difficult to determine that you are necessarily even an outsider. You're almost treated as an insider in that sense. Um, most of the controls uh, in in uh, corporate networks today focus on that inbound traffic. So what I'm going to allow into my network. Um, there, there's very open perimeters typically though with um, being able to go out of the network. So uh, the, many of the firewalls we see, or if if we're using application firewalls or things along those lines, allow uh, all outbound connections. That's that's kind of a default. Um, there, there's definitely more attention being focused on anything incoming into the system and trying to protect the resource rather than once that resource is compromised, can it then send its data out of the network? Can it, can it send um, company information in an email or maybe uh, connect to a Tor network or something so that it can try to hide itself as, it, as it's leaving the network? Um, so this is a big, uh, a big risk in the, the traditional network in that sense. Um, BYOD is another another big one. Um, we see a lot of uh, bring your own device policies in use today, um, and these are typically unmanaged devices. So they may not follow the the policies and controls that you've put in place. Um, you may not be able to install your software to them or or have the same level of control that you would over a company issued asset. Um, there was a study done by this group, uh, ProBand Research, that um, in the, the survey that they conducted of the, the their users, 72% um, of their breaches were from unsecured wireless devices. Um, so essentially, users bringing in their own printer or their own uh, phone with the hotspot or things along those lines that, that allowed um, uh, data to either be exfiltrated out of their network or allow attackers to get into their network uh, because of that. And we're seeing this be um, uh, a lot more relevant in, in today's scenario as well with the, the, the COVID pandemic. Um, users are being sent home, uh, not able to, to work from their, their company issued machines. There's just, there's not enough managed equipment out there for everybody to take home. Um, we're also seeing uh, VPNs aren't, aren't necessarily being able to hold up to the, the extra bandwidth that they're experiencing from all of these users needing to work remotely now. Um, so it's having some large impacts to, to some organizations uh, and how they're, how they're responding to that. Um, but we also have the concept of a mobile user. So it, th this is going to be something even after the pandemic where we want our users to be able to not necessarily be in the office, be able to travel, work from uh, uh, hotels or things along those lines, but also from their home office. Um, we see a lot of use of web applications to facilitate that, but we found that 54% of web app vulnerabilities have a public exploit available. So th there's a lot of um, a lot of risk that's adopted when we when we introduce this type of model with the traditional uh, security of relying on perimeter defenses. And then as we move into infrastructure as a service, uh, we're moving into software as a service, bringing in the internet of things into the environment. Um, 
the old model of uh, having the castle that we're protecting with our perimeter security, they, there is no longer that castle. That castle exists here in the network. It exists in AWS. It exists at the, your user's home office. Um, there's, it, it's too big to be contained with just a single perimeter. Um, when we go into SaaS or things along those lines, those applications are outside of your perimeter protection. So you may be relying on um, the controls that are that are put in place in that environment, but the overall security strategy of the organization likely doesn't take into account um, or is not able to enforce, at least in that regard, um, uh, what what that protection looks like outside of your environment. And there can be gaps. So uh, there may be situations where you're relying on uh, an external resource to provide a certain level of, of security. Um, and the, the way that that corresponds to your internal security policy uh, leaves a vulnerability or leaves, leaves an exploit that, that somebody can take advantage of. Um, and again, as we saw earlier, once you get past that perimeter, once, you, once you're into the network, um, typically bad things can, can happen because of that. So zero trust, the benefits as we get back to that, uh, it's, it is more secure. It, it's going to alleviate the reliance on the perimeter. We no longer have to um, uh, focus solely on people outside. We're gonna watch everything all of the time. Um, the trust is not based on where you're connecting from because it, it no longer becomes relevant essentially where you're connecting from, maybe that's just a piece that you're evaluating as part of that, whether you're a remote user or, or a, a local um, on-site user. Um, but the idea is that um, we're going to have more, more security or more uh, control over the system besides just at that perimeter level. Um, we're gonna protect access to data, but we're also gonna stop the ability to send data out of the system as well. So when we're dealing with uh, company resources, whether that's uh, uh, data or an asset or something along those lines, um, the connections that those systems make to other systems are all evaluated. Uh, it's not just uh, outbound traffic or, or outside traffic coming inbound to the network. Outbound traffic is taken into consideration as well. Any connection that's gonna involve company data is evaluated and, and authorized. Um, so that's gonna kind of close that gap uh, to, to prevent uh, exfiltration of, of company assets. Um, we're gonna uh, alleviate the reliance on full policy deployment. So what this means essentially is um, you, you have endpoints that are out there. You, you try to keep everything uh, up to the latest and greatest patching levels, uh, you try to ensure that the right security policies are applied, that, that you've hardened the systems appropriately. Um, but in the perimeter environment, uh, the weakest link is essentially the thing that's the, the easiest attack vector for, for somebody to, to compromise and then get past that perimeter security and, and get access to, to further systems from there. So um, with the zero trust network, when we're when we're evaluating every connection, when we're looking at the state of a device that, it, that it's in, when we're evaluating whether or not that connection should be made, um, it, it reduces the reliance on uh, all of the endpoints being, being perfect in that sense. If, if a single endpoint is compromised and we've eliminated the, the lateral communication within the network, that, that one endpoint being compromised doesn't lead to uh, further attacks within the network, allowing the user to kind of move uh, to their desired target. They're, they're stopped at one endpoint. If they compromise that and move on to a next one, they're stopped there again. So it, it puts in good controls to, um, to be able to alleviate the reliance, at least, that, that everything is perfect. Um, so then we get into why is zero trust more secure? Um, so there's a, a few areas where this really comes into play. Um, for BYOD, um, security compliance is um, uh, essentially considered uh, in the evaluation as we look at uh, 
external devices and user devices, whether they're going to be allowed to, to connect to resources. Um, we can control the communications or encrypt the communications at least that are coming from those from those user own machines uh, to our, our corporate assets. Um, but we can also evaluate uh, those devices, whether they're managed or not, um, to be able to determine whether or not they should be able to, to access the resources that they are accessing. Um, for mobility users, essentially, uh, historically, we've relied on the VPN uh, to provide us that security. Um, but with the right model in place and the right controls in place, uh, we can allow a user to connect over an internet-based connection, um, whether that's to a, a SaaS resource that's in the cloud or whether that's to a resource uh, internally within our organization by, by protecting the communications, um, by ensuring that eavesdroppers who are watching over that session aren't able to, to see the data that's being passed back and forth. Um, and also by um, uh, evaluating who the, the users are in the first place, uh, making sure that, that they are who they say they are um, and that they're asking for the appropriate resource on the other side of the connection um, that, that contributes and allows maybe a more flexible mobile workflow in that regard. Um, and then as we get into um, infrastructure as a service or internet of things, um, we don't have to rely on those protections necessarily that, that multi-tenancy would, would supply. Uh, we're not just assuming that that's going to be enough. Um, we are going to still evaluate the connections and ensure that, uh, um, that the appropriate resources are accessing the appropriate data um, and we can respond and reflect to that as we see those types of communications change as well. So uh, if there is a SaaS application out there that one day starts asking for uh, more data than it's previously asked for, or new types of data in different locations, things along those lines. Um, same thing with the Internet of Things as we have uh, all of these devices within the network that are connected out to the Internet and to, to some external resource. Uh, monitoring their behavior and being able to adjust and react um, to how they're connecting to the environment uh, or to resources um, it gives us a, a better security posture than relying just on the, the traditional perimeter network environment. Hey, John, uh, yeah. I just want to chime in real quick. Uh, just a time check. Uh, we, you know, this was a 45 minute webinars were 2.41 on my clock. So I just wanted to uh, say that. And uh, I mean, I'm, I know we're probably going to go a little uh, longer here. And uh, this is more a call out to everybody who's uh, on the uh, SMB here. And hopefully, you don't, you guys are able to uh, stay on for a few more minutes um, beyond that, because we did start yep. a little late as well. So yep, uh, thank you, sir. Sorry, go ahead, John. We are, we are uh, uh, moving through the through this here, though. So. Um, the other piece I'll mention to this um, is that um, implementing a zero trust model. Uh, so if we have uh, infrastructure as a service and we have software as a service providing some of the key resources that, that are typically provided by on-premise components, uh, and then we also adopt a zero trust um, security strategy that can enable you to, to move to an internet only network where essentially you're, you're fully eliminating the reliance on, on the corporate network. Um, and, and being able to just, just have an internet connection and still being able to achieve uh, the same, the same uh, end, end results. Uh, and I think that's the overall logical pro progression or the goal um, that, that we'll eventually get to. Um, so uh, how zero trust protects data? Again, we, I've kind of covered this a little bit earlier in the, the conversation. Um, it, the, the concept is my resource or my, my endpoint wants to access some kind of data. Uh, I have that policy decision and the policy enforcement being conducted between that. So every connection, there's authentication, there's authorization, um, where essentially, if you were to look at this compared to the historical model, you have your, your, uh, your users and your your resources all within the same network and there's just an implicit trust between them. Um, Zero Trust introduces this PDP slash PEP um, to essentially not implicitly trust or not, not just inherently rely on 
hey, this user is inside the network, let's go ahead and let them into the system, um, take, take further evaluation uh, into whether that connection should be allowed or not. And the closer this, this box here can be to the resource, the, the better uh, we're getting. We wanna shrink the, the implicit trust as much as possible. Um, essentially, we're, we're treating our internal network the same way we would treat the internet. Every, every part is hostile. Uh, there, there's an attacker around every corner. And it takes more than just credentials to get access. So um, username and password, that's great, but as we saw earlier, it's, it can be easily compromised. Um, so we want to evaluate other other components alongside just uh, credentials to to determine whether or not a user should be allowed to connect. Um, so that's that's part of the trust algorithm. Um, you're, we're taking into consideration who the user is and what their attributes are, but also what system they're looking to access and the attributes that are associated to that. What the policy is as far as whether that. Um, resources required or not, the various threat intelligence that's out there, all of that goes into the decision making as far as whether or not the credential should be, or the connection should be allowed. Um, as we look at um, uh, cloud migration, um, users going outside of the office, uh, being mobile or remote, um, validating everything uh, as far as data access requests and having all the uh, communications be encrypted, um, we're gonna see less reliance on VPN connections. Um, it's also a, um, a security strategy that, that expands beyond just inside the network. Um, I mean, beyond just what the, that line of the network looks like. Uh, and uh, the analytics, the, the capturing of information to be able to continuously evaluate the system um, helps us to improve over time. So it's a, it's a growing and kind of living thing as, as you go from there. Um, in relation to um, web applications or SaaS models, things along those lines, um, requiring that uh, uh, every communication is authorized and that uh, only the appropriate communications are allowed, uh, we're gonna prevent maybe data from being dumped out of these locations. Uh, if a BYOD device is compromised or an IoT actuator is compromised, something along those lines, uh, it doesn't give the, the attacker a, a, a position that they can then approach or achieve the rest of the network from. Um, and then as we, I think uh, a big piece of this is uh, how does this apply to print? So what does the vision look like for a uh, same convenient print experience? Um, so we know users want print to be seamless. They want it to always be there. It should always be on and, and I just wanna be able to print. Um, I, we have users that are going outside of the corporate environment. So they're, they're losing their traditional connections to, to network printers and, and we wanna be able to provide a way for them to be able to print from outside. Um, Print is going to originate from non-corporate owned devices. Um, I may have my own phone, I may have my own laptop that I need to be able to print from. Um, and uh, organizations want to get out of the print management business in the sense of uh, uh, facilitating all of the, the various infrastructure that's associated with, with printing in a traditional model. Um, there's some challenges that we have to consider in this as well. So, um, uh, print has traditionally relied on that assumed trust. Um, uh, most of the uh, delivery mechanisms that we use for printing are unencrypted. It's essentially um, behind the, the firewall. So well, why do we need uh, to encrypt that traffic or we can just trust that the end users aren't gonna be eavesdropping on that. Um, and the delivery and submission of print typically occurs without authentication as well. Um, we may have to um, authenticate to map to a print queue or something along those lines, but very little prevent the user from being able to just deliver a job to a printer, as we've kind of seen uh, in some, some very public uh, uh, printing usages before where people have compromised other organizations' printers to, to print things they shouldn't have. Um, and, and print devices are very open by default. So um, 
when you get a print device and plug it in, it's listening on a whole variety of different ports and allowing a whole variety of various connections to it. Um, large print infrastructures are a challenge for many organizations. We see a lot of uh, a lot of print servers out there that are still running server 2008 still, uh, maybe server 2012. Um, so they're definitely not the latest uh, security posture that they that they could be at. So they, these these gaps essentially exist for how do we overcome these these challenges? How do we be able to print from anywhere, whether it's a mobile device, whether it's my uh, shared office space, like a WeWork environment or something along those lines? Um, and how do we keep the company data protected? So if I'm going to be printing from outside the network, how do I make sure that that, that information stays secure? Um, how do I control access to my printer assets? If somebody can just walk up to a device and, and use it to make a print job, but also maybe to copy something or to scan something outside of the network. Um, and how do I see what's even going on in my environment? Uh, what, um, what's being printed, who's printing, where is it being printed to? That kind of data that's uh, associated with printing um, and then keeping the system up to date. So obviously uh, being, being patched to the latest level is, is one of the first lines of defense uh, against security threats. Um, so maintaining that system and being able to, to, to keep it uh, fresh in the environment. Um, the answer is Beacon Sentry Print. Uh, it's a, uh, a comprehensive cloud native service for print management. Um, so it is built ground up as Sriram was mentioning. Um, so we're able to leverage kind of all of the uh, the good offerings that um, hosting in the cloud has uh, regarding redundancy, uh, horizontal and vertical scalability, and uh, security uh, policies that, that we can put into place as well. Um, because of the cloud service, it's constantly up to date. Um, as soon as we release an update into the environment, it's able to take effect for all organizations. So you're no longer needing to manage uh, software versions. Um, but it's it's also software running in the cloud, so you're no longer needing to manage the operating systems, the databases, any of the underlying infrastructure in the environment. Um, and it it's a secure print workflow, so you're able to secure your printers, secure your print jobs, um, whether that's in the cloud or on premise. Um, some other great benefits to this, uh, so security is inherent to the design. Um, we have end-to-end -end job encryption, both at rest and in transit. Uh, we have authentication, authorization, and accounting for clients, for printers, for administrating the system. Um, we're able to establish uh, lease privilege uh, administration where uh, roles can be defined for just those specific uh, permissions that are necessary. Um, and uh, we're able to use IPPS, essentially a, a secured IPP delivery, uh, one of the latest printing standards that are out there compared to uh, a raw or an LPR based print delivery, they're typically unencrypted. Um, it also allows the printer to be hardened though and um, uh, have all the open connections that are on and closed off. We're, we're not gonna rely on those or, or need those to be in place. We have the ability to have users submit jobs from anywhere. So they can be on network, off network, at a Starbucks somewhere. Um, they, they can submit their jobs into the system and they can also release their jobs to any device, whether they're, uh, I, I have the system to where I can release a job to my, my printer in my home office, um, but I can also travel to the office, release a job there, travel between sites and, and release jobs to, to any location. It, this system works very well with the zero trust environment. Um, it, it abides by the practices that, uh, 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 or the, the principles that, that make up zero trust. Um, it works very well for traditional networks and, and organizations that are moving towards that zero trust model, uh, brings printing in line with, with the zero trust principles. Um, we also have another mode for zero infrastructure though, where we can be fully cloud only. Um, in this type of model, we have some other benefits. Um, uh, we're able to work in an internet only print environment. 
Um, and because it simplifies uh, the, the, all the connections are essentially to the cloud, um, it simplifies the implementation. It makes it much easier to implement zero trust um, because uh, of the nature of, of the design. I'll show that here in a second. Um, but we see it as a kind of a logical progression, um, moving uh, applications to the cloud, moving infrastructure and platforms to the cloud, um, uh, adopting zero trust as a network uh, strategy, security strategy, um, eliminating infrastructure and moving into a zero server mode. Um, and then the ideal being that we can just completely uh, rely on um, external services to provide that uh, experience and, and just have an internet connection and, and operate in that mode. So here's where we see um, uh, zero trust uh, being applied by the, the Beacon environment. So we have print scouts um, that are authenticating up to the Beacon cloud. Um, we have our printers that are authenticating users uh, to a device scout, which acts as kind of a, a middle component into the cloud. Um, end to end encryption of the print jobs as they're stored on the, the scout and sent to the, to the print devices. Um, Beacon is providing that policy enforcement, so it is facilitating the connections between the various components and making sure that the, the components are authorized um, and decided appropriately. Um, to take it to the next level, um, we have uh, a zero infrastructure model where essentially we're removing that, that local component um, and having the printers be able to pull their job down from the cloud directly. Um, so this is this is how you get to that zero um, zero infrastructure, zero network, uh, just an internet only connection. Your print scouts print jobs up to the cloud. Your printers pull jobs down from the cloud. Um, there are some scenarios where organizations still want to be able to have their print scouts print directly to the printer rather than uh, have the the traffic up and down to the cloud. And so that that option is available as well. Um, uh, and all of these models, both of these models, uh, abide by uh, the zero trust principles and, and concepts. So John, I think uh, we'll have to wrap up uh, <laughs> with uh, five minutes left. Uh, there's questions that are coming in as well, so I want to at least take a few of them uh, yeah. if you have a minute. We do. Yep, I, I have some time. Okay. Um, so a few, I mean, we have quite a few questions, and the, for the ones that we can't answer today, we'll definitely get back to you guys. Uh, one of the common questions is, can we get slides? We will definitely, you will be able to get, uh, we'll, we'll actually put this uh, entire uh, presentation on YouTube so you'll have access to it and also we'll send you sli slides separately. Um, is, uh, this is a good question, actually. I don't know the answer to this. Is Pharos running zero trust environment ourselves? Hmm. So I don't think we fully adopted um, zero trust for all of our applications. Um, we are using things like, um, uh, beacon, for instance, for our printing. So our printing does abide by uh, the zero trust uh, principles. Um, there are other services that we're using as well that abide by those as well. But I don't think um, I, I don't think we have the policy applied across the board to um, to all of our resources. We still maintain um, an internal network, and there's still some implicit trust that. So this is a journey that organizations are going to take. Pharos is, is um, moving towards that direction, um, but it's not something that you just flip the switch overnight and you have zero trust. It's it's a progression. Um, as you as you saw back in the the original architecture diagram I, I shared earlier, um, all the various data feeds and components that that can contribute to a zero trust system. Um, we still see the the environment or the the the, the available offerings that are out there in the space um, uh, a little bit of a ways away, maybe a couple of years away before we'll see um, the ideal zero trust implementation um, that, that just every organization can adopt. So it's gonna be bits and pieces that organizations um, can take. I think starting with the policy, starting with capturing what your print devices or what, what your um, uh, endpoints are and what your resources are and then determining which endpoints should have access to what resources. I think that's the that's the place to start, um, and then it's a, it's an evaluation from there on on how quickly you can move. So that's a it. that's a 
good point because there's let's say the point there is the journey uh, for every organization. It's not they're not it is it's not a uh, zero or one digital switch. So thank you for that. I'll take one one uh, maybe one last question here, and then uh, Lindsay, you can jump in and uh, um, you know uh, get 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 us off. Um, so is Pharaoh's working on a zero touch configuration for the deployment of north south communications with the device. I mean, with the in, in the world that we're in now, I think zero touch is another concept that's been uh, been hearing quite a bit about. So, yep. um, you, you want me to read that um, again, John? Is Pharaoh's working on a zero touch configuration for the deployment of north south communications with the device? Yep. So um, we. We have several different ways of achieving zero touch for printing. In, in the Beacon space, um, uh, we have a QR release uh, or mobile release, essentially, where you can release jobs from your mobile device uh, or with an SR25 unit, which is a, kind of a, a module that you would affix between the printer and the network um, to facilitate identifying who the user is. Um, and so with the SR25, you, you tap a badge, uh, a, card, a card swipe, essentially, to, to identify yourself. In both of those scenarios, um, your print jobs are released after you've authenticated to the system. Um, so they are zero touch. You don't have to interact with the screen on the device or anything. Essentially, you touch your mobile device and you pick up your print jobs. Um, and those do abide by uh, the zero trust uh, principle. So you, you, you would be able to achieve zero touch with zero trust. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, Lindsay? Sure. Hey, John, can you go to the last slide? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple webinars coming at the end of this month and in July. I did put the registration links in the chat area. So if you would like to sign up to attend any of them, you can find the links in the chat area to sign up right away. At the end of June, Uniprint product owner Jeff Harold will explore the upcoming product releases planned for the summer. He'll talk about Uniprint, Chromebook support, mobile printing, and an important touchless printing feature that makes it fun and easy to release documents without having to touch the printer interface. We've had a lot of questions and interest in this, so you'll definitely want to join this roadmap webinar. In July, product owner Scott Oswald will be introducing Blueprint Enterprise 5.3 Update 2 and everything it brings to print management in the enterprise. So we've got a simpler and more flexible user experience, improved print policy management, the latest security standards and technologies, and much more. So that is yet another product webinar you'll want to be a part of. We do have a few other topics in the works, so you'll want to stay tuned. You can find a complete list of upcoming events as well as recordings to all of our past ones on the Pharos website at pharos.com forward slash events. So with the, that, the, uh, the, the link seems to be not working. I'm getting a bunch of things uh, just saying. So uh, I just want to say a comment. Go to pharos.com slash events, and you will be able to find all the events there. Um, so the link in the chat isn't working, but that's, sorry about that. That's OK. Yep, sorry. Um, so with that, I'll just give a special thank you to everyone who joined us today and who hung on until the end. I know we went a few minutes over. And to John, thank you for taking us through all of the content. We will be following up with everyone with a link to the recording of this, um, the slides, as well as I'll make sure that we include working URLs of our upcoming events. <laughs> and Actually, just an extra parenthesis, apparently, of what I see. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, and if you have questions or comments about what you learned today, please don't hesitate to reply to that follow-up email. Reach out to anyone at Pharos, and we'll be happy to get you the answers you need. So we hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, and please stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you.